Hello everybody, my name is David Dadge and I am the moderator of this press conference. I'm the spokesperson for the third extraordinary congress and this congress has one subject, one subject only, which is remuneration rates. We have two speakers with us. Uh, I have to my immediate left the Director General of the Universal Postal Union, Mr. Bishar A. Hussein. And on my far left, I have Mr. Kenan Bozgayik. Mr. Kenan Bozgayik is the chair of our Council of Administrations. He is the chairman of this extraordinary Congress, and he's also the Director General of Turkish Post. Now, what I would like to do is we will have a brief statement from the Director General of the Universal Postal Union, and then we will go into a statement from Mr. Bozgayik, uh, a brief statement, and then into Q&A from yourselves. Please could I ask you when you put your hand up for a question uh, to give your name but also your media organisation as well. So let's start as quickly as possible. Uh, Mr. Hussein, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. David Dutch, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Bosgay, who is our Congress uh, Chair here, and me members of the media, good afternoon to you. Uh, my name is Ambassador Hussein. I'm the Director General of the Universal Postal Union. And uh, I'm sure now, by now, you are quite familiar what UP is all about. We have become very famous. Uh, of course, we have always been famous, but uh, I think it does really have farms. Uh, that this union is uh, really uh, relevant and important to encounter. Mm -hmm. Today we are gathered here, um, really, um, we've invited 192 countries, uh, probably we may have well over 130 countries, 140 countries may be present already. Um, the only objective for our meeting here today and tomorrow is just like David has just said, is only to deal with one important topic and that is the compensation systems we we we have in UPU for remuneration uh, on exchange of our postal items. This has been a subject uh, of uh, so many congresses since 1969, and um, every congress we revisit it, we review it, and uh, of course a new set of tariffs are set up, and then uh, of course. Uh, from 1969, you can imagine how the world has evolved. So, what is happening is just like what I said in the morning, is that our, the change, the pace of change in our business, in our structures, in our environment, and the industry and technology was so fast that probably our the cycle of decision making, which is every four years, uh, was probably not good enough to catch up with the uh, with the needs of the market. So, in light of uh, this background, I would like to say that um, uh, uh, we already had some work going on, uh, even from Istanbul World Congress, which is the last Congress which determined the tariffs. Uh, but uh, uh, midweek, uh, even at that Congress, we had set up a task force to look into this further. And um, we came to Addis Ababa uh, last year in September. And uh, this was again looked at, but by that time, I think. Uh, uh, a big country, United States of America, had already sent uh, their, uh, what do you call, official communication to me as Director General, informing us that uh, if the system is not reformed, and uh, they are going to quit the, the, the UPU. So that's really set uh, uh, the dynamics, a very fast pace. Uh, was set up uh, in October last year, the council, the governing body rather, uh, let me say, uh, met and uh, gave uh, as the Secretariat uh, instruction to be able to uh, facilitate uh, several uh, uh, meetings, a lot of consultation from member countries to fast track the work so that at least by April uh, this year during the, the council session we were going to come with some uh, compromise uh, solution and also with the intention to keep the United States within the, the family of uh, the EPU. Colleagues, I must say that uh, you will appreciate uh, the, the dynamics have changed so fast and there's so many different interests and um, so we were not able to reach really a consensus so that's why we have got uh, uh, different scenarios. The countries that support an option which they call it option A, 
which is more or less uh, the current system but with a little bit of uh, increased uh, tariff rates uh, over a transition period of five years. And then there are those uh, who have taken the other extreme position called option B, which is the United States of America, supported by Canada, Brazil and a few other countries, who really want an immediate uh, self-declared rates. And of course, uh, when we realize the two extremes, uh, a number of other countries, uh, Japan, France and, and, and Germany and a few other European countries, supported by other countries from other regions, came up with what is called um, uh, an option C, which is more or less a midway between uh, the two extremes. So, this proposal uh, gained a lot of uh, momentum, got a lot of support from member countries, and uh, in no time, I think, uh, we had a proposal, which we thought even in terms of Secretary to be really fairly uh, uh, balanced. Uh, but here we are again, um, the options was not satisfactory to member countries in April. A decision was made again now to call for an extraordinary Congress. Uh, we sent out a communication to all the member countries uh, to decide whether they want to come for an extraordinary Congress or whether they could even vote from their, from their distance. But again, member countries opted to have a physical meeting here in Geneva today and tomorrow. So, what you're going to hear today and tomorrow is uh, really a discussion by the plenipotentiaries and members of uh, uh, member, mem heads of delegations of these countries to decide which of the options will be preferable to uh, come to an equitable uh, system for the Union going forward. So that's where we stand. Um, Option A, as I told you, supported by United States and others. Option B, uh, sorry, Option A is by uh, China and uh, France and many other countries. Uh, Britain, I think, uh, I would say um, a number of countries have expressed their, their, their, their support for this. On the other side, we have got uh, Option B, which is United States, Brazil, Canada, and some Nordic countries. Uh, I don't know who else is with them or not. And then uh, option C is uh, uh, somewhere in between. Many, many countries are really in view of this support. So this is uh, where we stand. And we do hope that uh, these sovereign governments who are gathered here today will be able to make a, a decision that will hold the country, union together and also to allow United States uh, concern to be addressed. Of course, the U.S. has asked for a number of things, uh, which you'll hear. But I, I can answer that if there's a Q&A before. I give the floor to the chairman to give this Go ahead, Mr. Bosgay. Çok teşekkür ederim, Sayın David. Thank you, David. Öncelikle bu tarihi günlerde İsviçre'de bulunmaktan ve Cenevenin yine bir tarihi sorumlulukla hareket etmesinden dolayı. First of all, we are gathered here for a, on an historical day in Switzerland, and I congratulate Switzerland again for hosting this historical day and sharing this historical responsibility. 35 yıldır birliğin bütün olaylarının içine almış olduğu İsviçre bugün de üçüncü olağanüstü kongre ile yine bizleri en güzel şekilde misafir ediyor. Switzerland, which has hosted many important events for the 145 years of the Union, again is hosting another important event, which is the Third Extraordinary Congress. Değerli Genel Müdürüm, bu üçüncü olağanüstü kongrenin içeriğiyle ilgili gayet güzel bir şekilde özet verdi. The esteemed General Director made a very good summary on the content of the Third Extraordinary Congress. Evet, dünya değişiyor. Yes, indeed the world is changing. Dünya değişirken tabii ki sektörümüzde de bir takım değişiklikler olması doğal. Of course it is natural that as the world is changing we might also feel the need to change certain things in our sector and in our industry. Biz de onun için buradayız. And this is why we gathered here actually. Ama bu değişimin birliğimizin geleceğini ışık tutması için uzlaşılı bir yol bulunması için gayret ediyoruz. But we are trying to find a compromised way in order to shed a light to the future of our union while also carrying out this and while realizing this change at the same time. Ee, ülkeler kendi ulusal çıkarları açısından değişik tercihleri olabilir. Countries might have different preferences in terms of their own national interests. Ama 
posta toprakları dünyayı kapsayan bu topraklar mutlaka daha güçlü bir şekilde Cenevre'den çıkması gerekiyor. But however the coastal territories which comp which comp which comprise all the world has to come up with a good solution. Ben bu noktada e, en adil çözümün bulunmasını ve uzlaşılan bir yol üzerinden yolumuza devam edilmesini birliğin güçlü bir şekilde bu kongrede tamamlamasını temenni ediyorum. I wish that we will be able to come up with the solution which is going to be the fairest and which is going to be within the framework of and within the spirit of compromise for the good future for the better future of our union. Birliğin genel müdür olan Sayın Bişar Hüseyin ve genel müdür yardımcımız Pascal Klivas başta olmak üzere bütün ulusal e, büro inanılmaz olağanüstü bir gayret sarf etmekte buradan başarılı bir sonuç çıkması için. Especially our general director Bishar Hussein and deputy general director Pascal Clivas and all the staff of the IB are making tremendous efforts to come up with a successful conclusion of this uh, congress. E, ayrıca kongre başkanlığını şahsımıza ve ülkemize verilmesinden dolayı da büyük bir onur duymaktayız. And we are also very honored to be appointed as the chair of the congress. Bu sebeple de hem İsviçre hükümetine hem de Ufu Genel Müdürlüğümüze ayrıca teşekkür ediyoruz. Therefore we would like to thank the General Directorate of UPU and also to Switzerland. Bu basın toplantısında bizleri de davet ettiğiniz için sizlere ayrı ayrı teşekkür ediyorum. And we would like to also thank you as well for inviting us to this press conference. It's a real pleasure. Look, we can move into the Q&A session now, but I'd just like to ask, uh, is there any, any interference in terms of the interpretation with regard to the live, to the filming? Uh, no, is everything okay? Good. Good. Um, if I could just try and invite the interpreter, perhaps just to try and whisper just a little bit to Mr. Bosgay. Anyway, let's move into the Q&A session. Um, gentleman with the black suit jacket over there to the right. Uh, Laurence Hiro for the Swiss News Agency. Uh, first, the US said this morning that only solutions B and C uh, might be acceptable for them. So if there is no compromise on one of these two solutions and they decide to withdraw, what would that mean uh, for UPU? Is that, would that mean the end of the negotiating function for, for UPU or even worse? And then we have any broad idea of the value, total value of the supply chain of uh, international mail and uh, international letters and small packages? Well, uh, I think you've given me a... I wish I knew, I knew the answer because that's why I call all 192 countries to find a solution to the problem. Uh, certainly, uh, UPU has always been a forum for uh, intergovernmental organization uh, and a treaty making organization. So we are used to uh, countries having different positions and different, um, uh, I mean, uh, really expectations. However, we have always been able to overcome all those uh, differences. Uh, we have a, a robust uh, uh, system in which we, we, we, we develop uh, consensus and I can tell you most of the things we hardly go to vote. It's done over consensus. But uh, on an extreme case like this, we do go. We have a voting system to go with. So option one, uh, option A and B is the preferred options. Actually, option B, I would say, is the preferred option for United States. They say that very well, uh, which means then they they get what they want. But uh, in a multilateral system like this, they do recognize that there is also the other parties who are also a member of the network. So. Uh, we have to find uh, something that's also comfortable for them. So, in my view, Option C was developed really to bridge the, the, the, the, the different extremes. And um, if you ask me, really, this is probably where the solution of, the, of, the, of, the, of this union may lie. But again, um, it depends uh, on how the countries feel. And this is a sovereign government, they'll take their responsibilities. Uh, but um, I, I believe that um, it will be useful to have uh, uh, a system that uh, is uh, going to be not make everybody happy, but not everybody sad as well. So everybody has to gain something and do something. So I, w I am trying to appeal to member countries to have uh, a, a position that is going to be uh, really negotiated and uh, uh, acceptable to, to a certain extent to everyone. Yes, please. 
Uh, just that. sorry, just to go back. And the value of the market, sir, measured in billions, would you say? Well, I really I don't have that statistics. It's, uh, it's really it's more technical area for me. But uh, I can tell you, uh, we uh, probably I don't know, uh, Mr. Mr. Dajj, maybe we'll answer that. But we can provide that information a little later. I'll come back okay. to you. Uh, in the front row, gentleman with the white shirt behind the camera. Hi, I'm Jamie from Associated Press. Um, I just wanted to know if you could tell us. Um, what will happen to the international postal system if the United States does pull out? What will the impact be? And, and just a second question, if I could, about the impact on consumers generally. If terminal rates do go up in some for these types of packages, what exactly is going to happen? Absolutely. The two questions are very valid. I can tell you uh, the departure of any country, first of all, is not desirable for us because no country has ever left the Union since uh, 1870. Four, so in five to twenty, it was created. This is the first time we have this situation. However, if you ask the question, what is the, uh, what what does it mean if U.S. departs from the Union? Union, U.S. is a very major player of the Union. They they are, they, they I mean, the economy is very big, and many countries have a huge uh, traffic uh, postal and packets uh, traffic with the United States. So a departure of United States from the Union would mean then it's a total disruption of the service of that country. Because the moment a country uh, uh, leaves the treaty, what happens is that that country does not exist for us in our, in our, in our, in our, in our global postal territory. So what that means is that uh, nothing really, we cannot exchange any mail or packets or parcel with USPS, which is United States Postal Services, uh, officially in the, in the form and, and, uh, and, uh, and the shape we know it today. So that means their stamps will not be valid for us. They will not be able to exchange anything. They cannot going to use. They're not going to use our IMPC codes and uh, and all other many many other services which they can get directly. One uh, thing I want you to recognize is that uh, this is a treaty-based organization, and uh, the advantage is that uh, with one signature, when you access the union, you are a member you have access to 192 countries automatically. And what this means is that if the U.S. have to leave the Union, it means it has to go and negotiate 192 different bilateral agreements with 192 countries. And you have to have 192 custom authorities. You have to do uh, many other issues that really have to be done bilaterally. Uh, in, uh, this international security customs, uh, IATAS and ACAOS, we have treaties with all these organizations which really affects the I mean, uh, impact on, on the logistics uh, global uh, supply chain system. So departing from this means all the systems and procedures and the standards we have developed will not be accessible to the United States of America. It's really a nightmare scenario for that. On the other side, the flip side is that all the other countries will not be able to exchange mail with, with the United States and therefore they will have challenges on how to send their mail to that country. It cannot be called mail anymore. If any bilateral arrangement uh, arises, then we consider that only as a commercial cargo. And uh, that, of course, there are other ways uh, private companies will do that. So probably that's the, the route they will go. And as for the impact on consumers? The, the impact, okay. Impact on the consumers, uh, again, in both ways. It means uh, money. For example, um, the big net exporters like China and many other countries, um, the moment you hike the prices, because you see, what, let me come back to this. In 2016, we developed a, a, a treaty-based rate in Istanbul, which was supposed to run up to 2020. So what those countries told me, told us, is that they go back to their customers and negotiate uh, discounts and prices and everything with that in mind, with that uh, with that, with that uh, rates in mind. Now, if you come in the middle of the session and say you have hiked it on the other side. So they have a big challenge and uh, they, are, they have a problem with their customers. And that would mean then that uh, they're saying that uh, uh, they may not be able to use the, the, the postal system again. So my worry is that uh, they may use other channels to d uh, deliver their mail to uh, what you call United States or those countries that are asking for high hikes. So if you ask me directly to the consumer, it means uh, big money for them. Uh, for example, if someone in the United States was ordering something from China, for example, and he was getting it at uh, $2, and the next day the whole thing is now going to $7 to $10 for delivery, of course, uh, I mean, the, the consumers and the customers will be able to uh, deal with that uh, in, in, like every other person would do. So impact-wise, it has a global impact. Now, the flip side, and the argument on the other side is, they say, look, these are commercial goods, uh, these are not social mail anymore, these are not letters, 
that are coming, it is uh, therefore they have a right to be able to demand for compensation for them to be able to pay, I mean, uh, to, to cover their costs. And they cannot subsidize foreign uh, mail which is coming out of this country. So the whole idea about this meeting here today is how do we strike a balance that we don't throw the baby with a basket in, uh, from the exporting countries and at the same time we don't uh, run loss uh, organizations, I mean, subsidize uh, other uh, countries' mail in, in, in, uh, in, in those countries that are net importers. So that is really where the, the crux of the matter is and this is what we are trying to uh, solve here. Thank you very much, sir. Could you just briefly explain what you meant by IMPC, just to ensure that everybody knows what okay. you meant by the acronym? International uh, Mail, it's called I, International Postal, uh, uh, it's, it's called IMPC. It's a code, it's a code system. It's just like a country code. When you want to dial telecoms, let's say, uh, plus one takes you to the United States, plus two, five, four is Kenya. I mean, plus four, one is, is Switzerland. So the, the, the code, there's a routing uh, system which we use uh, to mail to to to to, to route our mail to, in, to a country, so that's a code which which, which by, by, by which a country is organised. That's what's called MPC codes and standards. Thank you very much, uh, lady in the front of me, followed by the gentleman with the black jacket afterwards. Thank you. Hello, it's Christiana with the German Press Agency. Another consumer question: In the in the event that the US leaves, are we going to see piles and piles of small packages packages building up in countries or in sorting centers? What exactly is going to happen on the 20th of October? Well, uh, if United States leaves, you'll you'll get those piles you're talking about here for sure. Because uh, somehow every country has to figure out how to send mail to the United States. Because you never, I mean, the, the, the, the traditional system will, will completely shut down uh, according to our current rules, unless that is changed. So it means then that all the customers that are sending and those who are expecting to receive will be disappointed globally. It's a disruption. A major disruption is on the way if we don't solve the problem today. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Ben Simon from KFP. Um, sir, you're a public servant from a developing country, and I assume you interact with a lot of other public servants from developing countries. Do you think it's appropriate that China still retain that title as a developing nation, given the size and heft of its, of its economy? Well, I think that is outside my, my purview. I don't uh, determine where, what, what is the level of development of any country. There, I think there are other bodies like United Nations, which, uh, which classify that probably they can answer better than I can do that in South. With due respect, I, I don't. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, in the front row, gentleman with the white jacket. Yes, good afternoon. John Zarek Costas from Penske Media Corporation in the US. I was wondering, so you elaborated uh, the differential between exporters and net importers. Can you give us an example for our lay readers what it means in a big country exporter like China export exporting to the US, what for a two kilogram package would be the subsidy equivalent given by the US Postal Service in a transaction like that? Just hypothetical. Well, I what we mean by net exporter is uh, is a country that uh, exports uh, a lot of uh, these small packets out of the territory, uh, outbound, outbound mail, it's called uh, net uh, exporter. A net importer is those countries that receive the, those mails, which means that the outbound is, uh, is, uh, is uh, less than the inbound. So if you have more mail going out uh, of your country than you receive, you're an exporter. But if you, so I hope you understand that. So the question is, uh, Please uh, remind me your second question you said. Um, what is the differential? What, what is the amount for a two kilogram package, for instance, that the net importing country would be subsidizing the exporting country? Right. This is again the, the, the contentious issue here. What happens here is that the uh, United States is saying that they want to determine their self declared rates. And here, this is something which, uh, when you say self declared rate, is, is based on what? They say our country costs. Who determines those costs? And who can police that? There are 192 countries, each one has a different level of economic development, each one has different uh, priorities and everything. So how we can figure out what is average and which, what is, uh, is, is a bit difficult here? Uh, and, and who will certify that? So this is a debate, that's the crux of the matter of what we are trying to, to deal with. But in the, in, in the amount of uh, volumes, of course, uh, the, the specific prices we have set for the small limit, pocket parcels, 
And uh, I think that depends on the volume, tra tra I mean, uh, traffic between two countries. I, I, I don't have those figures. I'm sorry, push this issue back. For our readers, what is on a two, kilo two kilogram package, what is the subsidy equivalent today? Is it 50 cents a package, 20 cents, 10 cents? Just to give a perspective to our readers, otherwise we're lost here. Okay, uh, probably, sir, with due respect, I can uh, refer that to my technical team who will deal with the finance issues, and we can give you that information a little later. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, Paul Eden from uh, CP Research. Uh, we report on global postal industry for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, just a couple of detailed questions, really. Can you just clarify how many countries are actually present here now, and therefore how many have voting rights, and therefore what would be the necessary majority for any of the options? Question one. Question two is if option C is accepted in voting for, what is the timings for the implementation of, of option C? And the third question, which I just forgot. Just those okay, questions. let me deal with the first the two. Uh, according to when we checked the forum this morning, we have seen nearly 140 countries, uh, I think, may have maybe here in this forum. How many have the credentials? Because again, there's another another level. Uh, the right to vote that I, uh, we have to yet to establish because the post people are still coming this morning. So I, I, I feel that we have, uh, I mean, uh, we have to deal with that. So uh, that, uh, that's not quite clear to me as I speak right now, but because these are uh, numbers that are moving. Uh, but I think we have a substantial quorum that can be able to, to, uh, to, be, to take valid decisions on that. Uh, the second question again. The second question is if, if option C is accepted. So again, the other question I had is can you just also take, tell us what is the timing for the votes? Uh, on the different options over the next okay. few days. Okay, uh, that's our challenge. Sorry, and then the final question then is, if C is accepted, what is what would be the timing for the implementation of C? All right, uh, first of all, the voting begins this afternoon on option B. Uh, there's a procedural issue here. Uh, what we do here is that, um, when we have so many options like this, the principle which applies to U the UPU here is that uh, we always take the option that is farthest away from the status quo is the one that's going to be addressed first. So in this case, B is the farthest away from the status quo. Therefore, the option which is sponsored by the United States and a few other countries will be the first one to be to, to, to go into, into a discussion this, this afternoon. And if countries now will have to vote on that, now the result could be either things. Either it is uh, it, it passes, which means uh, uh, it is uh, voted impositively. And then everything else falls. C and, and B and A and A, C minus, whatever we're talking about, all, everything is, becomes, uh, is, is gone. But if uh, A, I mean, sorry, if B uh, does not get sufficient support, then we can go now to C. And C has, uh, you see, C has developed uh, uh, 12 different proposals around C. So the feeling I got here from member countries is that uh, C had a lot of. Uh, interest of compromise maybe around C. I don't know. This will depend on the member countries. But if uh, A does not pass, then certainly we're going back to C. <coughs> and countries now will have to uh, see uh, where, what that theme will look like. So there's some people who want to push the C towards B, so that the, the, and the other group which wants to have a C minus pushing them towards uh, an A. So that's where the, the, the, the divide will be. But uh, if, in my uh, opinion, we, we feel that could be the the, the the the area of compromise and discussion. If, if that was option. Paul, one follow up, and then and then Nick after that. The only follow up is just to clarify if any of the C um, options are any of the option C um, amendments are accepted. Basically, when when would all this actually be implemented? What would happen next? If that all right. So. The, the, the time scales on this things. There's, there's an implementation phase of about five years, beginning 2021. Uh, there'll be a baseline for this year, which is 2020, uh, and then from there, 2021, 22, 23, 24, 25. That's the transition period, which is actually embedded uh, in, in option C. Thank you. Nick, go ahead. I, I, I presume that uh, you have some questions for my chairman. No, no, no, no, no, no, no, no. Well, I'll address this to you first, if I okay. may. Okay, okay um, please. If option B was adopted, what is the formula that would be applied to determining self-declared rates for 190 countries? And secondly, um, I've heard delegates suggesting that if the United States 
was to pull out unilaterally. Um, somebody described it to me as the beginning of the end of UPU. Would you endorse that view? How, how, how would you think? Well, uh, let me answer the, the, the question. Really, UPU is a, a UN organization with 192 countries. Uh, we've had other organizations that uh, why U.S. was a member and they pulled out and, uh, and it was not the end of that organization. So I think, uh, of course, there's a big disruption, certainly, but uh, the sun will always rise and member countries will find other alternative means to be able to, to exchange this global network. I don't think it's going to disappear just like that. Well, the first question. The first part I missed it again. <laughs> the first question was, if, if option B were adopted, how do they determine the self-declared rates for 190 countries? Well, it means then that um, every country will be able to set up their own rates and, uh, and uh, so this, the current system will, will, will, will fall. That's what it means. Because this is the decision. So UPU will not be able to, to set the rates for any other, mem uh, any other terminal due system. So it is everybody for themselves and then uh, we have to have a, a, a, an agreement. Uh, I mean, it's, it more or less will be a, a bilateral agreement will be in place, I think. To sort of, Okay, uh, are there any other questions? There's a lady here who's been asking. Uh, okay, I, I'm very sorry I didn't see you before. Let's just have a, a comment from Mr. Bosgayek and then go into the final round of questions. Right. Do I ask a question or...? Uh, no, we'll, we'll take a quick comment on the questions from Mr. Bosgayek and then I'll come back to you, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, all the questions were addressed to Albert DG, so I was relieved. Ben dinlemede kalıyorum. Şurası çok önemli. Bizim buradaki esas çıkartmamız gereken birliğin güçlü bir şekilde bu kongreden çıkması. This point is highly important. The real message has to be that the units, the union. Uh, has to overcome this problem and strengthen the networks that he has. Hiçbir üyemizin çıkma gibi bir sorunla karşı karşıya kalmaması. No member country should face uh, the withdrawal of any other country in the future. Ve bunun için de uzlaşma yollarının tamamı sonuna kadar çalışılıyor. Therefore we are uh, really working hard on the compromisation routes. Ama şunu da görmek gerekir ki tüm ülkeler bağımsız kendi kararlarını kendiler veriyorlar. But we also need to need to understand the fact that all the countries are sovereign countries and they can make their own decisions. Ben inanıyorum ki bu üç günlük e, yoğun çalışma trafiği sonrasında bir ortak yol bulacağız ve birliğimizin devamı yolunda bütün ülkelerin hepsinin istedikleri gibi olmasa da bir çözüm üreteceğiz. And I believe that during this three-day working period, uh, we will try to find a common ground to make all the countries happy, and we will also provide our union to be kept as a whole. E, dünyadaki rekabet e, tüm ülkeleri kendileri yönünde farklı kararlar almaya zorluyor. And there is a very intensive uh, competition all around the world which forces every member country to make their own decisions in various manners. Sizlerin sorusunda da vardı. Buradaki en önemli meselelerden birisi bu maliyetleri artıracak ve nihai tüketiciye yansıyacak. And uh, you also asked the question about this issue. Uh, this overall uh, general status will increase the cost and it will have a negative impact on the customers. Bu sektör olarak bizim arz ettiğimiz bir şey değil. And this is not something that we desire as the sector. Dolayısıyla maliyetlerin yükselmesinin önüne geçecek tedbirler almamız gerekiyor. And therefore we need to take immediate actions in order to prevent a high cost. Ve çözümün bir ülkenin çıkması ya da kalkması şeklinde değil, maliyetlerimizin optimize olması şeklinde olmalı diye düşünüyorum. And the solution is not the withdrawal of any country or keeping all the countries all together. We need to focus on maximization and opt sorry optimization of the cost. Yaklaşım, yaklaşımımız bu olursa çözümümüz daha doğru olacağı kanaatindeyim. And I do believe that if optimization uh, is our solution, uh, is our approach, then the solution will come faster. Aksi takdirde maliyetlerin yükselmesi nedeniyle bütün dünyadaki yaşayan insanlar bizim sektörden uzaklaşacaklar. 
and otherwise uh, the cost will be higher in the future and all the people will uh, escape from our sector. Bu da bir ülkenin birlikten çıkmasının ötesinde tüm ülkelerin sektörünün e, zarar etmesine ve e, ayakta kalmasını zorlaşmasına neden olur. And actually this situation will conclude uh, not only the withdrawal of one member country from the union but it will also have a very negative impact on all union all on all member states in this sector. Ama ben çok pozitif yaklaşıyorum ve mutlaka buradan bir çözüm çıkacağımızı düşünüyorum. But I am highly positive uh, about the discussions here and I do believe that we will have a very common solution to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The lady with the v neck black jumper in the corner to the left. My goodness. That's <laughs> observant of you. Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. First, if I got this correct, I think uh, the uh, United States does withdraw from the agreement, then it will be obliged to delivery organizations like UPS and DHL and FedEx and so forth. So then I would like to know, a $4 package, how much would that cost? You know, what would that price be? And then secondly, uh, there is some question as to whether China is a developing country or not. But there are uh, countries in Africa and elsewhere where there is no question that they are developing countries. What will the impact be upon countries in Africa specifically and developing countries? Well, Madam, just, uh, just to answer your question, really, uh, as I said, the moment a country uh, walks away from a treaty, the Universal Postal Union, all the services and all the standards and uh, the rules uh, that govern uh, the, uh, the international sub uh, mail supply chain system they have developed over the 145 years will no longer be accessible to them. So, even with those they are going to make uh, bilateral arrangements, that is not postal mail, that is, that's the cargo. So, and they, uh, when airlines carry cargo, they can take my, uh, in whatever form or shape, but we don't call them mail, because they, that's not a stamp. So, and there are many other things that are attached to this. There's international accounting system. How do they compensate each other? How do they deal with issues of uh, uh, uh, a return merchandise service, for example, the inquiries that follow, the security issues, the stuff. There are host, I can, I can tell you, more than 20, 30 different uh, uh, things that cannot be able to be addressed by one. You see, here with one signature, you get access to all these services. But when you get out, then you're on your own. So the same problem will be on the reverse side because all these other countries will have to deal with them on similar terms as well. So it's a big disruption that I have said. Now the question of how much it will cost uh, a packet, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Once you declare yourself, declare it, first of all, you have to say what your terms are first. And then the customers on the other side have to know. And those postal organizations, or whoever, if you call them, whoever you are, they're dealing with on the other side, have to, have to load those costs of the new tariffs which they have set up into their costing, then it will impact on the customer. So there's no question for me in, in my mind that, you know, we are going to have our price hikes. The whole, the whole thing about this generation is, is some countries wanted to hike the prices, and others saying, no, let's keep it low. So this is the way the debate is. Uh, well, so, and the implications for developing nations, or well, less developed nations? Here, it affects every country, not the uh, developed or developing countries. Of course, the, the same tariff which was raised, if the U.S. says, okay, fine, this packet of two kilos will cost 10 kilos, I mean, uh, 10 dollars in their country, and that's going to be uniform for everyone else. So this is the way we see it. So that would, uh, may have an impact on, on every country, to be honest. I don't know really. I've, I can't give you specific figures of how much it will impact on developing countries, but certainly developing countries exchange mainly with the U.S. and any other country that, that, go, that may wish to go that route. And therefore, the, the consequences are quite there. We have written a full report on this, 
70 pages or 80 pages on this, on the consequences of the departure of a major country, you can find them on our website, then you probably have to give you a more detailed uh, issues. Okay, last question. There was another lady who put their hand up, I think, over, over here. I think at the back. Uh, do you still wish to ask a question? Okay. Okay. Gentleman to the, my left. Anadolu Agency, Bayram Altı Türk Chiefs Agency. Uh, I ask a question to Mr. Kenan uh, mm -hmm. Ozgi. Uh, you are very optimistic to find a solution uh, between the uh, four the options. What if you don't find uh, common ground during this uh, extraordinary assembly? Uh, what is the next step for the UPU as you are coming uh, from the sector you, as you are one of the key members of the UPU? Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, Uzun süredir yaptığımız çalışmalarda e, şunu görüyoruz ki birlikten ayrılmak hiçbir üyenin lehine bir durum değil. Ben inanıyorum ki bugün B seçeneğini de tercih eden ülkeler kendilerinin çıkmanın lehine olmadığını farkındalar. Ve bu müzakerelerde e, mutlak suretle bir uzlaşı yoluna varacaklardır. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I can say that we have been uh, conducting very long-term studies and we have been carrying out discussions on this issue. And uh, I believe that leaving the UPU will never be in advantage of any member country. And the countries who voted for option B are also well aware of this fact. And therefore, I. Uh, sincerely believe that the countries will focus on discussing the option C to try to find a common ground. Ve bu B seçeneğindeki büyük olumsuzluk birlik üyelerinin önemli bir kısmını olumsuz bir şekilde etkilemekte. And this uh, big negativity about the option B will also have a big negative impact on majority of the member countries. Ve dolayısıyla birlik üyelerinin bu konuda pozitif yaklaşmayacaklarını görüyorum. And I do uh, I can see that the EUPU members will not show a positive approach towards the option B. Ancak üyelerimizin şu konuda da iyimser olduklarını görüyorum. E, kendi düşüncelerinin ötesinde fedakarlık yaparaktan bir orta yol bulmak için çaba sarf ettiklerini de görüyorum. But uh, I think that our members are really optimistic and majority of the members are uh, paying efforts in order to compromise. Dolayısıyla bu anlamda mutlak surette bir orta yolun herkesin lehine olduğunu düşünüyorum. Therefore at this stage I do believe that finding a common ground and a joint solution ve, will be in advantage of all member countries. Ve hiçbir üyenin birlikten ayrılmasının kendi lehine ol, olmadığını gördüğünü görüyorum. And I do also uh, see that every member country realizes the fact that leaving, withdrawing from the union will never be in their advantage. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, uh, David. Go ahead, sir. Okay, um, let me just say something here, please. Um, so that I am not misread or I'm misquoted. I am very optimistic we are going to find a solution here. Countries can come with different positions, but um, we have a track record of solving things. We have survived two world wars, and the Universal Postal Union has always uh, really reinvented itself. The history will bear us out that you know every single technology, when they arrived on the scene, people thought the postal will disappear. When the aviation came and, and the railways came and the, the, the motor vehicles came and, the, and we moved from the horses and, and the, I mean, that was the change of technology. When the internet came, we came with new services. When the, the telegraph and everything came, so everybody, every age, has, has we had had our own challenges. This is a, a new age. We have been having serious problem with the substitution, electronic substitution for our normal social mail. The letter, the, the letter mail, has been declined for a couple of years now. And understandably, people are using now new technologies. But technology has always been an enabler for us to provide a better service and faster services. And that's why today we have entered into, into e-commerce space, 
We're using the latest technologies. We're using drones. We're using uh, robotic uh, and, and, uh, and artificial intelligence. And, and we, are, we are really in the cutting edge of, of things. That's why today the biggest growth potential for the postal network is the e-commerce and financial services, which all use the digital uh, uh, transformation that uh, all countries are going through. So we are there very current. We are there with the customers. And this problem here is just a small one in our view. And it's, we are going to have uh, uh, watch this space uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow. You'll see that you know we'll come to a conclusion and compromise. I'm not seeing really the departure of any country here, or rather a stalemate to to to, to, to happen in this meeting. We may have different uh, hard discussions, but eventually I'm optimistic that we're going to have a conclusion which will be able to keep the union together, and no country is going to walk away, and we will be positive uh, that. Uh, this union is going to see another 145 years coming. Thank you very much for your attention and um, for your questions, and I hope uh, we've clarified some of your con uh, uh, concerns. Okay, thank you much. Thank you. So we do it here? Um, no, we'll go back to your room. Just to say very, very quickly, obviously we're releasing press releases, other statements as we go forward with the Congress. Please keep in touch. This may not be the last press conference, okay? So thank you very much. I'll let you know. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Really good. Sorry. And what you said was perfectly on message. By the way, in the nature, I used to work with Ruslan Floyd Dogan. Ruslan Dogan. A long time ago.